Hey there everyone, it's Christy, and uh, we're going to be doing a slightly different format for uh, a different Atheist Reads History of God by Karen Armstrong. I need to test out this screen capture software that I got in part uh, with the funds that I've received from my patrons. I've upgraded my software, and I, I want to take this out for a test run for some tutorials I need to do. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to um, get two things done at once a test recording and getting through um, the penultimate chapter of Ch Karen's book. So I know that there are a lot of people waiting for this and I've had this, these slides prepped but I haven't had the time so this seems like a good efficient way to do two things at once. So let's get going. The thing I have to say about this chapter is that I generally am is, you know, quite disappointed with Karen's stuff the farther along we get into it. And I was trying to put my finger on what problem I had with her approach. And I think the thing that really stands out for me as most annoying is that she tends to rely on sort of a great man view of history, that there were these influential men, very rarely women, you know, maybe in political roles like Queen Elizabeth or something like that. But, but generally the view is that there are some important men who think thoughts that are seminal and transformational and are sort of, you can use these individuals as markers for time periods. What she doesn't really do is make an effort to contextualize these European men often, um, or just men generally, within the wider social context, within the historical context, and the narratives that people were telling about themselves at the time based on events. One of the things that we're going to look at, you know, is sort of like the 19th and going into the 20th century. She doesn't really talk about the impact of the First World War on Europe in terms of its secularization. Uh, that's not sort of how she reads this. And so part of my problem in these last two chapters, or just generally in her book, to be honest, is her reliance on individuals as if those individuals were driving society, when I think it's more likely that an individual is a product of their society and then they add new information to it. So it's, a, it's an interactive process. And in this chapter, sadly, she just kind of goes through and starts listing off what people think again. So, starting at the beginning of the chapter, she, or in starting the chapter, she writes, by the beginning of the 19th century, atheism was definitely on the agenda. The advances in science and technology were creating a new spirit of autonomy and independence, which led some to declare their independence of God. This was the century in which Ludwig Feuerbach, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Sigmund Freud forged philosophies and scientific interpretations of reality, which had no place for God. Well, again, these assertions, you know, it was on the agenda. Whose agenda? Where? In what countries? For what people? Is this a real phenomenon, or is this just something that was happening within elite communities? And then how did the events in the elite communities bubble down to ordinary people? This doesn't get covered in her writings. She goes on to say, indeed, by the end of the century, a, sig a significant number of people who were beginning to feel that if God was not yet dead, it was the duty of rational, emancipated human beings to kill him. No citation there for that comment uh, whatsoever. Going on, she writes, the idea of God, which had been fostered for centuries in the Christian West, now appeared disastrously inadequate, and the age of reason seemed to have triumphed over centuries of superstition and bigotry. Or had it? Dun, dun, dun! The false narrative, I would say, and that's my opinion here, uh, that Karen wants to create and reinforce in this chapter is that it's, it's, a, it's a subterfuge for her to promote her mystical view of God. She doesn't like the idea of treating the God of the Bible as a character, as a, as a thing, you know, an indiv individual with preferences and and uh, a conscious, you know, of having a personality, basically. She wants to treat God as a mystical force of woo-woo that is associated with anything positive, and you have to basically invent your own God through imagination and emotion. And when you do that, somehow you're getting in connection with reality, maybe? Anyway, getting back to this, um, what she is going to basically use as a counter in this chapter against that more literal view, shall we say, a literalist interpretation of God as a character from the biblical text. And she's going to counter it with romanticism. And, well, I, maybe I'm giving her too much credit, but I think her point is that the romantic poets and the people who pushed back against rationalism are 
closer to what God should be like than the scientists who were rejecting a notion of God that Karen would say is false from the beginning. That's kind of, I mean, I'm trying to read this chapter in a way to try to get a bigger theme out of it, <laughs> um, but it's not always easy. This kind of, yeah, this is where I'm getting my ideas, right? The anthropomorphic personal god of Western Christendom was vulnerable. Appalling crimes had been committed in his name, yet his demise was not experienced as a joyful liberation, but attended by doubt, dread, and in some cases, agonizing conflict. Some people tried to save God by evolving new theologies to free him from the inhibiting system of empirical thought, but atheism has come to stay. There was also a reaction against the cult of reason. Again, the cult of reason, the cult of secularism. She's really like disparaging of that side of the human nature. Sorry, that's not in the, I th that's commentary that obviously is not what she wrote there. So continuing on with her passage, the poets and novelists and philosophers of the romantic movement pointed out that a thorough going rationalism was reductive because it left out the imaginative and intuitive activities of the human spirit. This reconstituted theology translated the old themes of heaven and hell, birth and redemption, into an idiom that made them intellectually acceptable to the post-enlightenment, depriving them of their association with the supernatural reality out there. Vielen Dank für alles Gern organisieren. Then she goes through and puts in some quotes by Keats and quotes by Wordsworth and William Blake and then mentions a guy named Frederick. And that's a great German word. I'm going to try to sound this out. Schleiermacher. That's probably close enough. And I'm not going to go over her basically like looking to Keats and looking to Wordsworth because it's not about a history of God. You know, the title is A History of God. So here's an example of what she writes. I'm just going to give you a sample so that you can see why I'm not going to go into much detail when she writes about Keats and Wordsworth and whatnot. When he spoke of feeling, Schleiermacher did not mean a sloppy emotionalism, but an intuition which drove men and women toward the infinite. Feeling was not opposed to human reason, but an imaginative leap that takes us beyond the particular to an apprehension of the whole. The sense of God thus acquired arose from the depths of each individual rather than a collusion with, uh, collision sorry, with an objective fact. The fuck? I don't... These are just words strung together, but they don't convey anything coherent. She's just putting words together that sound nice, but there's nothing that you can actually learn about the external world from the series of words structured in this sort of syntax format. You just can't. She goes on to write, <coughs> I'm going to apologize here for reading, but sometimes it's just easier in between Karen being irrelevant to let her own voice come through and give you a sense of what I'm having to try to deal with in this chapter. Jews, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians had all insisted that their different ways, uh, in their different ways, that human, I, our human idea, let me start this again, take three. Here's a little, I think sometimes it's just easier if I read out a, a bit of what I'm trying to summarize with Karen because it gives you a sense of how difficult it is to sum her up. Jews, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians had all insisted in their different ways that our human idea of God did not correspond to the ineffable reality of which it was mere, a mere symbol. All had suggested, at one time or another, that it was more accurate to describe God as nothing rather than the supreme being, since he did not exist in any way that we could conceive. Over the centuries, the West had gradually lost sight of this more imaginative concept of God. Catholics and Protestants had come to regard him as a being who was an other, 
Reality was, was an other re reality added on to the world we know, overseeing our activities like a celestial big brother. Not surprisingly, this notion of God was quite unacceptable to many people in the post-revolutionary world, since it seemed to condemn human beings to an ignoble servitude and an unworthy dependence on what was incompatible with human dignity. The atheistic philosophers of the 19th century rebelled against this god with good reason. Their criticisms inspired many of their contemporaries to do the same. They seemed to be saying something entirely new, yet when they addressed themselves to the question of God, they often unconsciously reiterated old insights by other monotheists in the past. They talk a lot, don't they? They have a lot to say, don't they? Who are these mysterious they? She doesn't say. And this is, you know, again, Karen trying to sound like she's smart and knows what she's talking about, when really she's advancing an agenda. What she wants to say here is, because a few um, literate men manage to write things down and lead movements, she can therefore speak to what people believed, even if they weren't literate or if they were women or their voices aren't represented at all in historical documents. She can know and that um, she also knows that how the West viewed God, even though what they're doing is just reading the texts. They're just reading the biblical texts as they're written, but they're not reinterpreting them to be, um, you know, uh, non-falsifiable, shall we say. Then uh, somehow the Christians in the West are doing it wrong because it's so easy to beat up on that bullshit. That's kind of, you know, that's basically what I hear her main argument being against, um, a, you know, a for or a mystical view of God. She goes on and then tries to appropriate Hegel. She tries to link the concept of the spirit and the phenomenology of mind to the concept of spirit in Kabbalah. And no, I am not shooting you. She writes, in the phenomenology of mind, Hegel substituted the idea of a spirit which was the life force of the world for the conventional deity. Yet as in Kabbalah, the spirit was willing to suffer limitation and exile in order to achieve true spirituality and self-consciousness. As in uh, Kabbalah, again, the spirit was dependent upon the world and upon human beings for its fulfillment. Hegel had thus asserted the old monotheistic insight that God was not separate from mundane reality, an optional extra in the world of his own, but was inextricably bound up with humanity. Like Blake, he expressed this insight dialectically, seeing humanity and spirit, infinite and finite, as two halves of a single truth which are mutually interdependent and involve the same processes of self-realization. I'm not gonna, I, if someone else who want, is a really into Hegel and really into Kabbalah want to verify this interpretation, I invite you on, you can come on and interpret Karen for us, you can come on the show and talk at length, because this just sounds like a, a lot of BS to me. She then moves on to Schopenhauer and talks again about what I think is a total load of shite. She writes, but Schopenhauer's view of salvation was close to Jewish and Muslim perceptions that individuals must create a sense of ultimate meaning for themselves. It had absolutely I'm sorry, it had nothing in common with the Protestant conception of the absolute sovereignty of God. You know, I don't, again, I think she's so desperate to link anything to Jewish, to any religious ideas, because she's getting paid by the word, or she promised so many chapters. But where is any evidence to substantiate this claim? that there are tons of Muslim perceptions that individuals must create a sense of ultimate meaning for themselves. Any text you want to create for that, or cite for that? Want to quote, in con you know, some page numbers? Um, again, I just, disappointed. She then talks about Kierkegaard, and talks about Feuerbach, and argues that God was simply a human projection in his influential book, The Essence of Christianity. She writes that atheism has always been a rejection of the current conception of the divine. And what is this always? You know, she doesn't um, talk about atheism much outside of, I mean, the, the other time I can think about atheism actually coming up and being acceptable was in Greek society. So what is atheism has always been? Again, you know, no basic referencing for her empirical claims. She also writes, the new atheists of the 19th century were in vain against the particular conception of God currently in the West, rather than other notions of the divine. Well, again, just to pull out an annoying citation needed. Um, where, again, where is any evidence of this? 
But where does, you know, they write about notions of the multiple notions of the divine? How can she say that that's what 19th century atheists were doing without any evidence? She goes on to say, thus Karl Marx saw religion as the sigh of the oppressed creature, the opium of the people, which made this bear suffering bearable. Well, yeah, that's one little thing that Marx wrote about God, but, you know, she doesn't do any scholarly citations of other people expanding on this idea, or other than cherry-picking this one quote that a lot of people know about and often misquote. That's not evidence. That's an assertion with a citation, but it's not evidence. Similarly, the literal understanding of God in scripture made the faith of many Christians vulnerable to the scientific discoveries of the period. And then she talks about Lyle's principles of geology and Darwin's origin of species. Uh, again, this is assertions that Karen makes about the link between a personalized God and it being inadequate and insufficient for, for people's religious life. And I don't think she's done anything to really establish that. It's her opinion. And she's riding her hobby horse. That's about it. After that, we're back to Karen's propaganda theme of the entire book. Throughout history, people have discarded the conception of God when it no longer works for them. So, you know, people will use God and then they chuck it away, and they chuck it away because it no longer rings truth for them. And what is God is truth, and what is truth is God, and therefore whatever is true for you at a particular period of time, that must be God, or your God, or your, your truth. Because mysticism. But don't make him anthropomorphic, because that's dangerous. She moves on to Nietzsche, and as she writes, uh, Nietzsche resorted to similarly violent tactics when he proclaimed that God was dead. I don't think writing um, with bombastically is violent it, at all. And she goes into a discussion of thus spoke Zarathustra, and I, I, it's from okay. I haven't done a lot of philosophy, but I've dated a lot of philosophers, and. Um, my understanding of thus spoke Zarathustra, that Zarathustra is, or Zarathustra, is that that is not a philosophical work in the same way as other Nietzsche writings are. And the, with the way that people deal with, say, the gay science is on a different level than with his writing in, in thus spoke. Therefore, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in reporting on how Karen spins this. And I've got uh, a link here if you, here, <laughs> I'll just write this. All this along with the book's ambiguity and paradoxical nature has helped its eventual enthusiastic reception by the reading public, but has frustrated academic attempts at analysis as Nietzsche may have intended. Thus spoke Zarathustra, <laughs> thus spoke Zarathustra, Thustra, Thus spoke Zarathustra, remained unpopular as a topic for scholars, especially those in the Anglo-American analytic tradition, until the second half of the 20th century brought widespread interest in Nietzsche and his unconventional style that does not distinguish between philosophy and literature. This is why I'm highly skeptical of Karen trying to appropriate Nietzsche into her agenda. She talks about Freud and psychoanalysis and Adler and Jung, again, um, uh, I thought this was a history of God, and of course this is all going to, God is an unconscious thing, God was similar to the God of the mystics, a psychological truth subjectively experienced by each individual. Crap. She gets on her hobby horse. When asked by John Freeman, quote, uh, I'm sorry, when asked by, meh, take this again, three, two, one. Karen then gets back on her hobby horse, and I'll quote here from page 420. When asked by John Freeman in the famous face-to-face -face interview whether he believed in God, Young replied emphatically, I do not have to believe I know. Young's continued faith suggests a subjective God mysteriously identified with the ground of being in the depths of the self can survive psychoanalytic science in a way that a more personal anthropomorphic deity who can indeed encourage perpetual immaturity may not. Bias. Agenda. Moving on, she talks about Tennyson and Dostoevsky, wanders into European chauvinism in, the, in some passages about Islam that happen to be taking place in that time period, but really have nothing to do with the larger question of the chapter. She once again uses the opportunity to big up mysticism in Islam, writes a bit of stuff about India, then she's back to Islam and Europeans and something about an Egyptian newspaper 
And what the hell does any of this have to do with a history of God? Then she turns to Judaism and writes some things about uh, some Jewish thinkers from the, the sort of the 19th century, early 20th century time period that we're dealing with here. Um, so here's the list of their names. And then she discusses Zionism. And honestly, at this point, I'm losing the will to live as she closes the chapter. And she closes the chapter with the story of Jews in Auschwitz who put God on trial. Honestly, I have no idea what this chapter was meant to communicate in terms of a contribution to the overall book and to answer a direct question about what we can know about the history of God. Because I don't think it's about a history of God anymore. It's not been about a history of God, basically, at least in my opinion, since about chapter four. Once Karen got off of the main historical texts, she just went from person to person to person and uh, put the great man of history story together in order to obscure her agenda that mysticism and the mystic, mystic god is the best god. All other gods are rubbish, but hers is, is awesome and real. Yeah, that's a paraphrasing Ricky Gervais there. All right, so I'm going to see if this has worked out as a test. And uh, we've got one last chapter to do. If this has gone well, I might even be able to get that done while I'm on holiday. We'll have to see how it goes. But until, I guess, the next time I, we do this and we wrap up Karen for good, she'll be done, we'll be done, we'll be free. Um, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. If you enjoy this, please do subscribe to my channel, like the video, um, and there's an entire playlist that you can catch up on, and lots of other cool content on politics and feminism that is there if you're new to the channel. And if you're a long-term subscriber, thank you so much for sticking with me all the way through this. It's been more than a year, um, and it's probably, I don't even know how many episodes, but we are troopers. We're going to get through this, and I will see you guys. Uh, next time for the last chapter from Karen Armstrong in her shitty, shitty book. Okay.